program showcases the visual and performing arts work of students and faculty, as well as regional, national, and international artists. Our spring semester programming focuses on healing and renewal. We're gonna save some time for questions at the end of the talk, so um, please consider that when uh, listening to the speaker. Today, we're excited to have artist Sandy Rodriguez with us. I'm gonna quote from her website because she does a lot. Sandy Rodriguez is a Los Angeles-based artist and researcher. Her work investigates methods and materials of painting across cultures and histories. Her codex Rodriguez Mondragon is made up of a collection of maps and paintings about the intersections of history, social memory, contemporary politics, and cultural production. She was raised in San Diego, Tijuana, and Los Angeles. Rodriguez has exhibited at a number of museums and cultural institutions, including current exhibitions at Denver Art Museum, the Huntington Library of Art Museum and Botanical Garden, the Amon Carter Museum of American Art, and Los Angeles County Museum of Art. Recently, she was awarded the Caltech Huntington Art and Research Residency, Creative Capital Award, and the Migrations Initiative from the Mellon Foundation, Just Futures Initiative, and Global Cornell. Rodriguez's work is represented in numerous collections, including the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art, Amon Carter Museum, among others. Rodriguez and her work have been featured in BBC News in the studio, Hyperallergic, LA Weekly, LA Times, New York Times, Spectrum News One, and on several radio programs and podcasts, including Latinos Who Lunch, which is great, and Modern Art Notes. Welcome, Sandy Rodriguez. Thank you, Mio. So it is such a pleasure to be here with you today in real life. This is the first lecture I've done in person for a college audience in two years. I have a, brought a few things here to share with you all. We're going to be taking a look at materials. We're going to be talking about some of the objects in the show. And we're going to leave about 10 to 15 minutes at the end for questions and discussion. I am just so grateful to Mio for having me join you as part of this series. And I'm very excited to get started. So the images that you see on the screen are paintings by my grandmother, Aurora M. Perez, and my mother, Guadalupe Rodriguez. Que descansen paz. As Mio mentioned, I was raised in San Diego on the border, grew up in Tijuana, until I moved to Pico Rivera, where I went to Osborne Burke Middle School close by. I've lived all over Los Angeles and have been here since 1987. But again, three generations of painters raised on both sides of the border with a family that has migrated back and forth. Just to give you a little bit of background about myself. The center of my practice is really materials and working with materials that are specific to the region of the Americas of Mexico and the US Southwest. The slide that you see behind me includes a number of colorants that I have foraged or been gifted by people over the past several years. So you see logwood, and I'm going to show you them in real life right here. This is called palo tinto, and it makes four different colors. The materials that you see here have been used to make a number of objects in the traditions of the Americas. And I learned most of this really by exploring the work of Diana Magaloni, who is a scholar who wrote a book called Colors of the New World, and then referencing another book that's 500 years old called the Florentine Codex. But it tells how painters prior to the conquest and invasion of the Spanish, use the natural world around them to make all of the images. So this palo tinto makes purple, black, gold, hot pink, depending on how you process it. 
You also have Maya Blue, which was created in the third century by Mayan artists. This is an indigo in a special clay from the Yucatan that's heated, so it's material from the underworld and material from the solar world, which is why artists um, have a very specific place within culture that is different than craftspeople. You also have chlorite. I didn't bring any chlorite with me. That's on the chart, but I did bring antlerite. And this is a mineral that's in its rock raw form from Arizona. Yellow, the yellow ochre. So yellow ochre and red ochre, Becky, this one and this one, are iron rich minerals that have been used in painting since artists were painting in caves for ritual and for communication. This is one of the most stable colors and when prepared is used across every painting medium since the dawn of civilization. Uh, cochinilla is a little scale insect. This eats the flesh of the cactus, the paddle tail cactus, the beaver tail cactus, and is a little female scale insect. Then when she eats it, she creates a red carmine in her body. And when you crush this little insect, you get this bright red pigment. This is the color that was exported and changed global markets like the logwood between the 16th and the 18th century. So this cochinilla is from the solar realm, from um, above ground, and this red, the red ochre, is from the underworld. This red ochre um, has a lot of uses in ritual. Some of the organic colorants, like walnut, look like this, and here in Southern California, we have walnut trees everywhere. And if you're on a hike and you see this beautiful green leaf, and I should have brought the leaf because I just saw it yesterday, you'll see these on the floor, and when they're broken open, it looks like a little piggy nose. And so it's the skin where you get the walnut ink from, but it's going to stain your hands, so just be prepared. Acorns, we have 22 different varieties of oaks in California, and after you process these and prepare tortillas or picadillo with the nut meat or milk, you can take the shells, soak them for a week, boil them down, and then make an ink by adding a little bit of a binder. A binder is gum arabic. Gum arabic is the gum from an acacia tree. This tree is from Senegal, though. Once you dilute it with some hot water overnight, it becomes a medium that sticks all the color together. In Mexico, painters used this orchid gum from this orchid bulb that when processed correctly, you use an obsidian blade, and my friend uh, Dan Calderon made me this, to chop it, then you boil it, then you dry it, then you grind it in a volcanic rock mortar pestle to make a powder to then make your paint. There are a number of other things up here that we can talk about a little bit later, but things that are not native but have naturalized, like pomegranate, it's the skin. You wait for it to dry, 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 you crack it with a hammer, and then you just take the skin and get rid of all the seeds. You boil that for like 15 minutes in water, you get a bright yellow watercolor, as long as you add a little gum arabic. Um, azurite, it's beautiful, beautiful stone. It's very sparkly when you paint with it, but it will change to green over time. So sometimes it's good to layer some of these colors. But I brought all of these things here and the watercolors that I prepared for you to take a look. This is the muller, and this is what you grind the paint on a granite or porphyry or a glass slab to make sure that the paint sticks together with the material. So that's what all of these uh, paintings you're about to see are made with. And I'm going to pass this around, so if you want to grab some amate paper, I just want you to feel this. This amate paper is sacred ceremonial outlaw paper. At the time of the Spanish invasion in 1519, one of the things that allowed for them to 
a attempt to erase a history was to destroy the libraries and the codices, these codex, these are Mexican manuscripts that record genealogies, that record histories, that are visual narratives. And all of those books were destroyed except for six. And those six are in various collections all over the world, but they're not quite here in Southern California for us to look at or study or spend time with, which is why the series that I've created is called Codex Rodriguez Mondragón, after my parents' names. So this is a sacred ceremonial once outlawed paper. And so I'm using both the color and the material of the paper to really support some of these stories that you're about to see. So I have a couple slides of some of the ochres. Um, one of my friends is amazing and he does a lot of analysis on the pigments. So when he's out collecting, he'll bring me these huge hunks or ship me these huge hunks of ochre. So that's what you're seeing right there. That's a big, bright chunk of yellow ochre. And you just rub your hand on it and your hand's bright, bright yellow. That's what my desk looks like at home. And I found that piece of glass in the alley and I just uh, used some, some special grinding material to like prep the surface so that it's rough. But glass doesn't really hold up to some of these other pigments, so I recommend going to like a marble tile place and getting a chipped one and then like sanding that and using that because that will stand up and hold on for a long time. Here's some of the process of the grinding that you can see, where I mentioned you grind it, grind it, grind it, you make it super fine, and then you do what's called levigation, where you pour water into it, so all the tiny particles float, and then you pour that into another glass, and then 24 hours later, all the fine, fine particles have dropped, and then you pour off the water, and then put some cheesecloth over it so you don't get a lot of bugs inside, and then it dries into a cake and it's like a perfect eyeshadow. And that is what you regrind again, and then you mull it with a binder to make your paint. Couple more images of that. And then you stick it in a mussel shell. The mussel shell is one of the best paint containers because you're not using plastic. You pick these up on your beach walk or after dinner if you've had mussels, but the brush, perfect for just scraping the excess off and it fits in your hand just like a perfect palette. Some of these other colorants and I brought some. This is Phalia schwinzii and I collected this mushroom and it's about the size of your head. I got it in 2018. There is a forest up in Mendocino County where you can apply for a permit and collect mushrooms. And I went with a group that was collecting mushrooms to cook and eat. But I was looking for the Dyer's polypore, which is this mushroom that you see behind me. And so I am in boots that are up to my knees that are meant for the rain because I'm having to go through leaf litter and hike down this hill looking for these mushrooms. But they only grow on the butt of the tree and they rob the nutrients from trees that make uh, cones. So this, while it's called a Dyer's polypore, Phalia schwinzii, the forestry department calls it butt rot. So I included that on the painting that I made of it. And the 12 year old in me just loves that name, butt rot. But you dry it, you dehydrate it in a regular dehydrator, like you're making jerky or banana chips, just get a regular dehydrator. And then you boil this in pH neutral water and it gets another different bright yellow. Um, and I would say that one is more greenish and the one from the pomegranate skins is more acidic, like a brighter yellow. And you can um, shift the yellows by adding something called a mordant. Here's one of the displays and I pulled apart some of the things um, from that display to bring here today. But basically, it's materials from the underworld on the bottom, materials from the solar realm, like plants and insects, and the second shelf. And then on the top shelf is the Maya blue that is the fusing of the two in the act of creation. And there is a little beautiful image of this. And if you want to pass this around, um, and you can kind of smell it through your mask but it smells like a perfume 
because this is a lichen that is intended for embalming, for perfume, for making three different colors. And I was reading a recipe by a woman who is an archaeobotanist who picks out little plant remains from uh, vessels in a museum. And she didn't understand why she found so many vessels with this organism. And it's because they used it to embalm the dead and for perfume and to make four different colors. So the recipe involves um, fermenting it like you would pickles or like you would sauerkraut or um, curtido, right? And you keep it under the sink and you shake it every night and it's 21 days to make this color and it's this beautiful pink. And then I find out it only works if you're working on silk or wool or feathers. It doesn't work on amate, cellulose. So it's like disappearing ink. But I will someday figure out how to do some of this work on um, protein. And so here you see some of the extraction and process as well as the um, pomegranate. Marigold, the same. It was a very, very difficult journey to figure out how to get the color from marigold. But after the other Los Muertos Altares, you have like seven or eight bunches of marigolds dried. Just take the heads off, boil a big, big pot, but you need a lot. And you can dye a bunch of different things. I dyed like three pillowcases and men's handkerchiefs and all kinds of stuff, but it gets a beautiful yellow. And you can punch it up with a little bit of turmeric also if you're interested in doing textile dyeing. So you see some of the yellow that came from there. So this map I want to share with you is the Mapa for Malinche and our Stolen Sisters. This particular painting took over two years worth of research and I've been working with the curators for almost five years now. There is an entire exhibition that is in Denver that is about the history of Malinche, who played a very, very important role in the invasion and conquest of Mexico and is scapegoated for being a woman who was a translator, the companion of Cortez in negotiations. But at the end of the day, she was kidnapped as a tween, trafficked, and made the best out of a horrifying situation. So in this map, I've plotted eight places of her birth, her kidnapping, her trafficking, her role in the Battle of Cholula, the fall of Tenochtitlan, where she has her first child by Cortez, where she's married to Cortez's um, colleague, Juan Camarillo, where she has her second child and where she is, uh, died in Coyoacán and then is cremated. But I've also included the hands of 19 other women who over the past year during pandemic were murdered missing indigenous women along the US-Mexico border. This narrative is not over. This narrative continues to be an ongoing part of the colonial violence and these cycles of abuse. So you see the details where I've created a visual narrative to tell her story. Most of the objects over the past 500 years that tell her story are told from Cortez's perspective or from the, the dominant narrative perspective. So it's 500 years of objects in this exhibition in Denver that will travel to Albuquerque in June and then to um, Texas, to San Antonio in the fall. But there's a beautiful catalog and there's a number of resources on the website. You can check it out if you want to see more of this particular piece. There's the image from her birth, and there's the image of her um, when she is trafficked, along with 19 other indigenous women, to Cortez. There's another exhibition that you can go by and check out locally at the Huntington Museum in San Marino, California. And it's part of an exhibition called Borderlands. I had the opportunity to teach a course last winter, but it was over Zoom. But it was how to make colors and how to create visual narratives with these hand-processed colors of this region to tell your migration story to Los Angeles. Because if you are not Tongva, your family migrated to Los Angeles. My family migrated to Los Angeles in 1915 during the revolution from um, Aguascalientes to Bunker Hill, but is now Chinatown. But my family moved back and forth, but we're still migrants who keep coming back to LA. 
So this exhibition of Borderlands has a re kind of contextualized way of looking at the American art collection. I got to teach as part of a fellowship I had with Caltech and the Huntington. And at the end of that, my curator said, well, what, what are you working on? What came out of that fellowship? And I showed him the sketch for this giant map. And so the museum decided to commission me to create a map of Los Angeles that has all of the names in Tongva, in Spanish, in English, for parts of Los Angeles and for sacred mountains and sacred streams and various sites of resistance across Los Angeles. But this thing is 97 inches by 97 inches in Anamata paper. I worked very closely with a friend for many, many months. And may she rest in peace, Julia Bogany uh, was a cultural liaison and Tongva elder who really helped me formulate this particular piece and research the names of these sites. And if you want to learn more about her and her work, go to a website that's called tobevisible.org. And she will have maps there that have all of the names of the various neighborhoods. Spanish invasion prior to the Anglo settlement of this region. And a number of letters that really kind of capture this moment of contact as well as incredible uh, narratives of resistance and uh, language resources like coloring books that have various names of um, plants and animals and places and amazing women. So there is the full image of the map that you can see. And I positioned the oak tree as the axis mundi, the center of the universe that connects the heavens to the underworld. And I've included various native plants and various native animals of the region, as well as these uh, locations and place names. So it's something that you have to kind of observe from a distance and get up close. And part of my strategy is to really invite people to an object and then confront them with a less comfortable history uh, and have them really talk about what it means to be here in this particular place. I also included three botanical uh, pieces that are plants that are specifically used for respiratory illness because they were created amid a pandemic where everybody is suffering from these respiratory illness uh, caused by the COVID-19 virus. So I worked very hard to get the names in Tongva for the plants with a number of artists and community members that are part of the uh, Tongva language group, as well as scholars, as well as various resources to get the names of the plants the way that they were for over 10,000 years prior to them being renamed by the Spaniards, prior to them being renamed um, by Anglo settlers and renamed by scientists. So you'll see this is Yerba Santa, and this is one of the most potent uh, respiratory plants. Over the past two years, when I am ooh, when I'm getting a scratchy throat or nasal congestion, I make a little tea cup of this. And it is absolutely amazing. But it has a number of uses, and so I wrote those into the labels. This particular one is that walnut that I showed you, Southern California walnut. And you will find it in various locations all across uh, Southern California. And you can go to a website that shows you a map of where you can go see these in the wild. This particular one is the oak, but this is the Quercus integrifolia, I believe. And I can't read because I'm not wearing my glasses. But um, the, like I said, there's 21 different oaks. This one makes a really, really small acorn, probably not the best for processing for food. There are much larger ones that you would want for food. But it, I wrote, again, the labels to tell you about different edible, medicinal, and utilitarian uses of these plants. This is an accordion book. So I had a friend. Um, Edwin Arceta, make me these accordion books. And so the one that you're seeing on the screen is 23 inches tall by 97 inches wide. I worked with an Otomi paper maker in San Pablito in Puebla to create these customized 97 inch sheets just for these books. 
So half of the plants on there are plants that are um, part of a remedio or a recipe for the treatment of trauma or susto because of this particular moment that we're living in, right? And the other half of the plants in that book are for the treatment of respiratory illness. So I call this piece plant medicine. Just like this little table setup that you see here, we created an entire gallery at the Huntington for you to go look at the methods and materials of paintings of the Americas. While there are a combination of mineral colors and organic colorants, the mineral colorants are what you're going to see in the oil paintings in the galleries. But we spent probably like eight months with so many different departments. And prior to being a full-time artist, I spent 20 years as an educator working in museums. And so really taking advantage of both of those um, strategies for engaging people allowed us to create an intergenerational education space that is in Tongva, in Spanish, in English, for you to go and really just get a close-up look. A lot of the materials that you see here in this gallery have uh, magnifying glasses, so you can really get a closer look at some of the particle sizes. I created a few studies. One of these is, oops, one of these is uh, the view for the San Gabriel Mountains up by Mount Wilson. And the other one is Topanga Canyon, looking out over Castro Peak. So one is painted in Cochinilla, the pink one, this one. And this one is painted in uh, red ochre. So I was just doing some color studies with those. Some more views of it. I also have an exhibition in Texas that features 30 objects that were created over the past two years. I spent the entire time in isolation as many of us did, and was working out in a foundation in Joshua Tree. So I was doing a lot of research, and my curator came, drove all the way from Fort Worth to come pick 30 objects for this exhibition. So it's a lot of portraits of plants, portraits of animals, portraits of protests, and I'll show you a couple of installation shots. So this one has the plant chart. As an educator and someone who lo loves to do research, I'll put up a big piece of butcher paper, chart it out, write my sources, write the names, figure out the uses so I can understand a little bit more about this place that I'm painting in. And this little accordion book is the same size as the one that you see right there in the case. And we also have the pigments in that case. These are 97 inches tall by 47 inches wide, and you can see a life-size portrait of a Joshua tree. I've always wanted to do life-size plant portraits, and this is the second one that I've been able to do. Next to it is a map that is called um, Mapa de Califas, Uprisings, Isolation, and Atrocities 2020 to 2021. So it maps... It maps things like the first person that died of COVID in an immigration detention center, the overturned vehicles, that police vehicles that were burned amid the um, protest during the summer, police tear gassing protesters in Oakland, and a number of other events that are outlined in the cartouche. So these are opportunities to really preserve a moment so that people do not forget what we all endured over um, this past here. So you'll see several studies of coyotes and plants, nighttime scenes, the passing of days where it became blurs day and you didn't know what day it was and some of us still don't know what day it is, but that's where you have the uh, phases of the moon. More botanicals, there's this one called COVID sunrise because in that first few months you'd wake up and you're like, is it real? Is it real? Are we really living through this? So there's a little bunny, it's like a self-portrait, who's like freaking out and like kind of pushed back on the sun with the COVID molecule rising over the, the ridge. Some more of the installation shots. And then this piece is for Robert Fuller and Malcolm Harsh, who were two African-Americans who were found hanging in front of City Hall and in front of the public library here in the deserts in Southern California, just a few weeks apart. And after protests and investigation, the sheriff's department declared it suicides. So on the bottom of this cartouche, I've written my thoughts and feelings and reflections on it, which is basically 
black men do not hang themselves in front of government buildings. So amid all of this you know, uh, year that we've lived, these are all the different narratives that overlap and are part of this particular exhibition. Oh, and so here's a closer look at the, the map that I was just showing, telling you a bit about. But see, there's the little protesting girls at the border at Otay Mesa. And there's the police cruiser on fire over at Fairfax. And then there's a little um, agave with a small mouse and a lizard stuck on the ends of it. And then there's a little bird on top. That bird uh, is called a loggerhead shrike in English. But it's also called the impaler or the butcher bird because it is too small when it catches its prey to rip its prey with its feet and its beak. So it has to stab it on the end of a, an agave or on a barbed wire fence to then rip the flesh to then go feed the babies. So much like you would get meat from a butcher shop where they have them hanging from hooks, same premise. But so that's in that particular detail. Here you have a self-portrait of myself as an anglerfish and I'm coming up underneath a customs border enforcement vehicle, or not vehicle, a uh, marine vessel, a boat, that is capturing migrants who are having to take these really dangerous trips through the ocean instead of land because of the militarization at the border presently. And when those boats shipwreck, border enforcement just go through and they fish out people and then put them in detention centers. Here's the scene that I was mentioning about the protesters in Oakland being shot with, I think, six different varieties of chemical weapons and tear gas. Uh, officers were just charged with 33 counts of excessive force this year. And there's a little camarón on the side. And it says, camarón que se duerme se lo lleva la corriente, which is basically keep your eyes open and the current won't carry you away. Like, you've got to be, like, vigilant um, in this particular time that we're living in. Here are some of the closer views of the botanicals. The one on the uh, right is uh, choya, and the other one is a sacred ceremonial plant called datura that is used in ritual, and it smells like heaven. You cannot touch it, though, because it has um, chemical uh, irritants that can cause a number of issues. So it's better just to observe, read about the plants, know which ones are safe to process and to handle, and which ones you have no business. <laughs> the, uh, the one on the left is um, uh, Basalia. And that one has these little tiny barbs, uh, worse than stinging nettle, and your hand will burn like you were playing with fiberglass. So again, it's good to look at the plants, study about them, understand how they've been used, and keep your distance when you need to. The one on the right is a desert indigo that I've been looking for for years. And it has these little tiny purple florecitas, these little flowers. But it is such a delicate plant that I went to go just get like a tiny handful and I was on this uh, private uh, foundation property so I can take a couple handfuls of the plants and process them. But all the bees were there and all the... Uh, flying insects that were pollinating were just like competing. So I, I was able to get a little bit and I was like, I'll get a little bit tomorrow. Well, that night there were 30 mile an hour winds and all the little florecitas went all over the desert. So they were blooming, they were there for a couple of days and then gone. But it makes a really interesting um, grayish blue. I, I'm sure that if I processed more than a small handful, I would get a different tone. This is the um, Calavera copters versus the hummingbirds. And we've all lived in Los Angeles. We know how much air traffic we have with these police helicopters. And the hummingbird has a very special and very loaded um, history in terms of how, it, how it's represented and what it um, has been used for symbolically in the history of painting of the Americas. And so this is really a reference to a book of natural history that's 500 years old that tells about the hummingbirds. The coyote. And so because I was on uh, Serrano Cahuilla land out in Joshua Tree, 
there's also some Chemwebi migration through the area. Um, I found uh, Kawia dictionaries. So Isili is the name of the coyote in the local native language. Coyote is also a word, coyotul is the word in Nahuatl, and then Canis latrans is the word in Latin. So I always try to include a little bit more about the names in which people have used to address these other entities and, and figures in a region. Here are my little protest girls that were um, small studies. So I do a lot of small studies on paper before I figure out how to do the big pieces. Because once you put a mark on a mate, you cannot uh, blend it, you cannot erase it, you cannot paint over it, it is in there. And then the militarized police that we saw and see so much of in Los Angeles and then across the nation. This is a map of the first weekends of protests. Um, during the kind of national uprising against police brutality. And then a second exhibition that you can see locally is here at the LA County Museum of Art. And it's part of this extraordinary exhibition. It's two exhibitions that are called Mishpantli. It was organized by Diana Magaloni. And you can go see um, objects that tell of the resistance to the war of the invasion and there's our, a number of maps and objects and then this other one that has contemporary indigenous uh, views or voices I should say. So there's an interactive map in this exhibition by a group called Cielo that documents all of the indigenous languages spoken in Los Angeles in a really beautiful interactive and they've got QR codes where you can hear the language is being spoken. There is a floor piece by a Mexican artist, um, as well as prints on the wall based on the first map of Tenochtitlan. And then you have my maps in this exhibition. So there's six of these monumental maps. The one that you are, so here's the installation view. And then there's a giant sacred oak tree that I painted in acorn ink in the center as the Axis Mundi making Los Angeles the center of the universe. This map is from 2018. And this is for Angelinos that were killed by police. So this maps all of the places where uh, Sheriff's Department and CHP and the police have gunned down our neighbors. There is an LA Times page that has a, a daily and weekly account of every time a police officer kills a resident in public. And so you read their names, you read their family's accounts, and it's really hard to spend time with it, but it's an important narrative to tell. And so this is painted in the Maya blue, really standing in for um, native, or not native, uh, indigenous communities and Latino communities and Latinx communities uh, that make up over 50% of the residents that are killed. And the yellow is from the pomegranate. There are a number of details in this map that you can um, really only appreciate in person. So definitely go check this out. Oh, and there's also a ton of fun and silly uh, sea creatures that you can really only <laughs> observe in person. But there has to be a little bit of levity between some of these heavier subjects. Otherwise, I would just cry in the studio. Here is the cosmic tree that I was telling you that I painted acorn ink. But there are some very interesting um, humping turkeys on the right-hand side and snakes going by and... Uh, woodpeckers and scrub jays in the trees. And so this was um, a much more, um, I'd say, hopeful kind of way of centering myself amid the past couple of years. And so underneath, you see the glyph of the mountain, and you see the sacred waters symbol, and you see a calavera that's connecting to the underworld. This is the map of uh, ICE immigration customs enforcement raids in 2018 when California was being punished for being a sanctuary state. There are moments of resistance. There are moments of hope. There are a bunch of omens. There are uh, references to book 12 of the Florentine Codex and some self-portraiture in this one. You can find me and my mom and my sister and uh, scholars that I'm working with up at the top. Some of my favorite people, including poet um, 
Adolfo Guzman Lopez, who's also a KPCC reporter, is in the guise of a waterfowl hunter. Um, definitely, if you have time before June, go by LACMA and check out this particular piece. This is the 2020 map for our neighbors that were killed by LAPD. And it actually has all of their names on there. And you might have remembered the story of Andres Guardada, who was shot nine times in the back at the age of 19 while leaving his work as a security guard. So it was important for me to paint this particular picture. And the stars on this one are not in um, the pomegranate skin, but in 24 karat gold. This is the mapa for uh, children who died of neglect in Customs Border Enforcement custody in 2018. So some of them were one years old, some of them were seven years old. But I include a lot of the remedio for susto or trauma because the first child um, who was Guatemalteca, the headlines read that she died of dehydration and shock. And so being able to really think about how do you honor their story and help them uh, and us kind of heal of the susto and trauma of living during this time period is part of that particular piece. Uh, I also spent 14 days <laughs> with at washing my hair on a field study trip in a four wheel drive going from outside of uh, Tucson, and then going all the way down to Nogales looking for medicinal uh, plants for respiratory illness that were also for dye. I was working with an herbalist. And so we were up in the mountains one day, down in the canyons the next day, across the desert, a thousand miles all the way to Texas. And when we were down in Nogales, the uh, Customs Border Enforcement vehicles are like dragging chains on the road. It sounds like the craziest, most awful sound. I couldn't really camp outside. I had to camp in the car. I was like afraid. And one night the, the vehicles all come up to the car while I'm sleeping and shine the headlights in. And I thought I was going to get pulled out by my hair, but luckily it was just to scare me. And then they drove away. But so there's a big uh, image of a border enforcement vehicle on that one. I'm going to go ahead and stop here because I want to leave 15 minutes for question, but I just want to close by telling you that this piece maps how in Los Angeles we have become the carceral capital of the world. We have more people in jail in LA than anywhere else in the world. And there is a text by a woman named Kelly Lytle Hernandez called City of Inmates that outlines how it starts in the mission period with the capturing of the original caretakers of this land, the imprisoning of them in those missions, and how now we have men's jails, women's jails, children's jails, camps, immigration detention centers, tender age detention centers, and how we've arrived at this moment. So that's what this particular map is. But I'm going to go ahead and stop here because now we have 15 minutes for conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sandy. That was really great. Now, now I want to go back and look at the exhibition at LACMA again because I feel like I could, I'll be able to see more. So at this point, I wanted to open it up to audience questions. Um, does anybody have any questions? Please raise your hand. They're shy. I yeah. know they do. I, I have a question. Do you um, do you paint with only minerals and only the these colors that you find in the earth, or do you also use other mediums other than these natural natural things that you have? That's a great question, and I'll tell you. When I started off, I was super strict, and I was like, I'm only using uh, the hand processed colors according to these recipes that are 500 years old because they have this conceptual and like spiritual use. Some of these plant-based colors, like the marigold and the onion skins and uh, the, just the plant-based colors, shift color very quickly. They fade. So in those instances, I'll take modern watercolors, because I've got a studio full of supplies that I'm not just going to let go to waste. So I'll, I'll match the color exactly and then paint that as the undercolor, but then also put the plant-based color. 
so that it has the kind of energy and the power of the plant, but it has more stability. But I was um, three generations of an oil painter, so I sometimes use oil paint, but when I can, I'll integrate some of the colors that are stable in oil, because you can mix any of these with plastic to make latex, with oil to make oil paint, to make any type of paint, but some of these colors shift in oil versus um, watercolor. So it's a lot of experimentation, but definitely I'm not as strict as I used to be. Yeah. That's a great question. Any other questions? I have lots of questions. I'm very interested <laughs> in this. So, a um, few years ago, there was a show at the Bowers Museum, Red. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A uh, really fantastic show, which talked about the cochineal beetles yeah. and everything. So, um, have you tried different binders to, to fight the fugitive aspects of those colors? So, the only binder that is um, known is... Lelia autumnalis, this orchid bulb. Mm -hmm. This orchid bulb, when processed, can become a super glue, like for creating the mosaics. You've seen those mosaics with the masks of the skulls with turquoise. So that's what this is used for. Mm. If it's prepared a little bit differently, it creates a UV filter that preserves the color of those fugitive colors. And the research was done by Diana Magaloni, who's the deputy director of LACMA, but she actually did the, is also trained as a conservator and did the analysis on the 500-year-old manuscript I was telling you about, the Florentine Codex. And she found that that was the binder, and that's why the color is as fresh and as vibrant in this year as when it was painted. Right. Yeah. Uh, now, in terms, of, in terms of those colors, and you were talking about how from one, from one pigment you can obtain different yeah. colors. D what kind of different extraction methods are you using? This is one of the most fun uh, parts of my process. And it's really relaxing to try to get color out of a plant and try to shift the colors. So this particular uh, logwood is the heartwood of this particular tree that only grows in Campeche, like in the Yucatan, and it grows at the tip of Baja. You get the center of it. There's whole plantations of this and like waterway systems and a crazy history of this plant. But to shift this, First, you have to have a clear understanding of the pH level of your water. Because I was doing a color demonstration here in LA. I know what's going to happen. But then I was on stage in Texas. And I'm like, and now my lovely assistant will bring me the boiling tea kettle. And I put, and I was like, oh shit, that's the wrong color. It was supposed to go pink, but it went a completely different color. And I was like, your water is not the same as my water. So you have to be careful with pH levels. So you just have a pH testing strip. And you can neutralize it, or you can acidify it by adding vinegar. I don't use urine, but people have used urine. Um, so once you get this, like you make a tea with it, like a, with some boiling water, it'll turn like a beautiful, almost like a garnet pink. But then if you add a crushed up iron tablet, like an iron supplement, it turns black. And this is the black that they dyed all of the robes for um, clergy in the 17th, 16th, and 18th century. If you add a little bit of alum, which I don't think I brought any, uh, it turns purple, 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 as purple as your bag. Yeah. And if you add a little bit of vinagre, it turns like this warm honey color. And because it changes so easily, this is why it was one of the most um, important dye stuffs for fabric. And this is why pirates would capture a whole ship and not have to work for the rest of the year. And this is why there are whole areas of the Yucatan that are exploited devastated because of these plantations. Yeah. Yeah. I remember in the show Red where they talked about how the ships were being uh, taken and, and they were capturing the blocks of carmine. Yeah. Um, and it was so important because they never had it in Europe. Yeah, before. and it's a really, really potent colorant that is yeah. really, really stable. And yeah, it's quite magnificent. Thanks. Hi, Sandy. Uh, first of all, congratulations. It's uh, and we're so we're so happy to have you here, and all will have the chance to go to work that we have the opportunity to see here locally. And thank you for 
doing what artists are supposed to do with, you know, during horrible times like this, you were, you know, it has been such a prolific, you know, period for you. Like, and, you know, that's exactly. Much for doing that. Um, but I, I have a question. My history of art, the history of Mexican art online students are watching this YouTube, hopefully now, or they will later. And so I have a question that will be, that I want to ask you, that I want to pose on behalf of them. We, in our, in ancient Mexican art and architecture that we've been studying, there's so many references to the multi-layered universe and, you know, underworld and celestial realm. And so, and I, of these pigments that relate, you said like this relates to the underworld or this relates to uh -huh. the earthly realm. Could you say more about that? Like which pigments, like how and what, what, what those meanings would have had to ancient, um, pe you know, uh, so I native would say peoples? One of my favorite things to do as I started doing this research is to look up on YouTube lectures by Diana Magaloni, who can talk more in depth about some of the conceptual um, connections between the underworld materials, which are mineral based and the solar realm materials. She has, I don't know how many lectures on YouTube where you get her expertise as both an anthropologist, uh, art historian and a conservator on the subject of color. Um, as I, as I mentioned, I think one of the most kind of concrete ones to, to repeat is the translucent reds from the cochinilla is used very strategically to reference the solar realm and the deities of the solar realm. Understanding that religion and thought, indigenous thought at the time of the invasion and conquest is prohibited one way that painters can communicate with audiences at that time about religion and spirituality is to use colors in a codified way. So if you want to talk about uh, an idea, you, you're doing it through color. You're doing it through painting. There is this transitional moment when the language that you and your community has used for generations and generations is now outlawed and or an opportunity to write it down in alphabetic text. So there's a lot of things at play at this time, but when you're generating a, a 2000 page volume of 12 books to tell the story of all that is knowledge of culture and history and time in Mexico in the Florentine, there are ways in which the Tlacuilos or the scribes, which are the first generation of uh, people who, whose families survived the epidemic that wiped out four out of five people in Mexico during the Spanish invasion and the conquest. If you survive both the, the epidemic and the conquest, your kids had this kind of legacy and moment and time. And so these are the scribes that were Tlacuilos, they were uh, speaking Spanish and Latin and Nahuatl and were recording these histories based on these surveys that existed at the time. Um, but definitely watch Diana's lectures because you can just sit there with your cup of tea and your socks and your house, like enjoying hours of uh, incredible uh, expertise about color. Do we have any other questions? Oh, we do see. They come out. They come out. You're gonna do it, and then she. Okay. Hello. Um, my first question was, uh, do you happen to have like a resource of like something that hasn't been, you know, like for the lack of a better word, whitewashed in terms of like a, a reference material, like a book, like to maybe start as like someone who's interested in using natural fibers, possibly for dyeing clothes or. Oh, just... there's tons. There's tons. Oh, you know what I would say. Go onto a website, it's called Botanical Colors. Mm -hmm. And there, there's like 15 different texts, like 15, $20 books, but start there. 
and take a look at a lot of the recipes, the ratios. Um, I can send you a list of books that I think are pretty good. There are a number that are in English. There's a number that are in Spanish. I, like, I have this wonderful book on uh, Colores Tintoreros de Guatemala. Like I've got all kinds of stuff. I mean, as a former librarian, I've got a big, big book collection. But there are a number of YouTube tutorials that you can play with. I would say just like right when you get home, if you want to play with some stuff, and you have onions in the house, take the onion skins, boil them, and voila, you have a beautiful yellow. And you can shift it with a little bit of alum or cream of tartar, just stuff from the kitchen. Um, you can, you know when you soak black beans, the water turns purple? You can take that and also make a watercolor. But if you want the more permanent for textiles, there's a number of, I know it sounds cheesy, but Facebook groups <laughs> for textile uh, people. There's also like entire groups of people that are just mycologists and uh, mushroom dyers. Like there are as many strange kinds of uh, areas of expertise when it comes to botanical colors. But certainly look at uh, the botanical colors website for a lot of the different links to different groups. And I'm sure that there are a number of other uh, resources that I'm just not thinking of right now. Thank you. And I was also going to ask if you could repeat the name of your Tongva elder who helped you with... Oh, Julia Bogany. Please check out her website, tobevisible.org. Thank you. Just incredible. Um, this is only really a question. I guess to say recent events of the pandemic into your art. Vince Art shows the. That derives from events. Living in the pandemic, it's just every single day, it's it's the norm, you know? It's like step up. Comfort zone. A lot of um, the events and murders that happen around us, like, they're all so close and they're all happening in California. They're our neighbors, you know? And it's just inspiring to me that I can make something out of what I've lived through historically, because it's unprecedented times. And even now, wearing masks, cases are down because it's really changed our reality. And I think the pieces really reflect that. Map is obviously a mark of our world. So thank you. Thank you so much. I mean, it's really important for me to be a witness and uh, be able to present these narratives back to you. I think we had one more question right over there. Okay. Yeah, I'm glad she said that because it's nice to hear our students' perspective on what's happening right now, and that's why we wanted Sandy to come. I have one more question. No, thank you, Sandy. Um, you know, I, I know we have a lot of art students who are interested in becoming arts, but it seems like, you know, it, to, to gain entry into the fine art world seems so opaque. And could you talk to us just really briefly about your journey becoming an artist and if you have any advice for any of our students, uh, I would really appreciate your uh, perspective on that. Sure. Um, as I mentioned, I'm three generations painter. My grandma, my grandpa, my grandma was a painter who did portraits and landscapes and worked in various uh, art studios and had various uh, patrons and clients. Um, they had a little gallery or curio shop in Tijuana. Like, she joined various art guilds. My mom and I went to school at CalArts at the same time in the early 90s. After she raised six kids, I've got five brothers and sisters. I always was excited about teaching. So I started off teaching painting and teaching in uh, municipal art galleries and being a, like a gallery uh, educator at museums. 
So I spent 20 years really figuring out how to engage people with artworks and with objects and with collections and how to make some of the stories more relevant. Um, it was 20 years of that work full time and painting on evenings and weekends while I developed a very large global network of people that I've worked with over those 20 years at all these different institutions. It's about paying your dues. It's about working on things that you care about. It's about working with people you love and respect and really making those relationships um, inspiring to your practice, whatever your practice is. There are as many ways of uh, working in the arts. It is an enormous ecosystem. But there is a way to support your art studio practice and to grow a network, because that's, that's what it's about. It's about relationships. And you can enter a number of open calls to like get a taste of all the damn rejections you're going to get and all of the opportunities that are going to fall in your lap. But it is as challenging a road as any road, right? And it's as competitive as any field. But if it is in your blood and you are compelled to do it, then do it. And you will get there when you get there. And what matters is how you feel when you're making it, how you feel when you're done, how you feel when you show it, and you know what motivates and inspires you. I don't know if that's uh, helpful, but that's my path. That's great. I mean, it's like what I always try to tell the student, don't let fear be your obstacle. Yeah. If it's important to you, you should do it. Um, I want to thank you, Sandy, for coming. We really enjoyed your talk. Um, before we clap for you and applause, because I know they will and you're wonderful, um, I just wanted to announce the next event because I think it connects well with this event. So the next event we have is on March 17th, so uh, a couple of weeks from now, we have um, an, a talk called Honoring All Things. Uh, a talk with Tongva artist, Samantha Johnson. So she's going to come talk about her work as an illustrator and kind of connect us with this land that we are occupying, which is Tongva land. And so um, she'll be the next event we have. Thank you so much, Sandy. We really appreciate it. Thanks for coming. Thank you. A closer look at some of these things in my accordion fold sketchbook. I also brought a couple of my coloring books.